Praise God. Welcome, everybody, to uh, class number seven of our course, um, Old Testament Books of History, Part One. And we're moving right along. We're in Second, in second Samuel, chapters one through twelve tonight. And uh, it's exciting. I, 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 like, I love studying the Old Testament. Well, I love studying the whole Bible. But as we go along, we can see a lot of things that Israel did that America is doing today. And I hope as you're reading, and as, as uh, C.K. and I were talking uh, recently, and, as several, and some others were talking, you can see the same things that got Israel into trouble Americans are getting into trouble. So we need to turn our attention to the Word of God, listen to the Holy Spirit, make sure we don't fall into those pits and those traps, and, 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 and get delivered, stay free. Uh, so as you journey uh, with me through the Old Testament, uh, stay alert and stay alert to the Holy Spirit, and let's avoid those pitfalls, and then we can teach others and then we can also uh, get directions for our prayer life. Uh, I pray much for our nation and our leaders and um, pray that uh, God would be glorified in this nation. I saw um, online yesterday a, a, a pastor has written, ask a question, whatever happened to preaching righteousness? And holiness. It's a good question. That's a good question. And when a nation turns its back on God and starts uh, uh, living a different way, preaching a different way, preaching their own gospel, that's danger. And so as we go through the Bible, let's believe the Lord to be glorified in our lives. And um, thank God. Also, let us continue to help one another and to assist one another. Uh, Today I've been fasting and praying for a little 14-year-old guy uh, down in uh, Tennessee, and, and he's got a calling on his life, and he's, he's preached on our online church before, and Satan's trying to destroy him. So I've been fasting. We've, several of us have been fasting and praying for him. So I'm not going to tell you his name, but pray for this little guy. God's got a calling on his life, but Satan's got other plans, but God's going to prevail. So pray for this young man's uh, deliverance and that he uh, uh, stays free from, from sin and, and, that, and, and bind the enemy, bind the devil. De the devil would love to destroy that household, but God's got a plan for them. Okay, okay. All right. Um, I see we have plenty of people on. We're going to ask uh, co-pastor Lisa Johnson from Coatesville, Pennsylvania, another one of your neighbors, Karen. Um, uh, we're going to ask Co-Pastor Lisa Johnson to open us up with prayer. Hi, Lisa. Hi, how are you? Praise God. Fine, thank you. Thank you. Um, let us pray. Father, we just thank you for this day, this time that we come together, Lord God, to learn. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, you told us in your word to get wisdom, all that getting, get an understanding. We ask you as we get the wisdom, which is the word of God, that we get an understanding of your word, that we may, be, uh, may apply it to our lives. In the name of Jesus, bless our, bless our apostle God in Jesus' name, and bless him and keep him, him and his wife in the name of Jesus. Cause him to do what you have him to do in Jesus' name, that you may be glorified and the devil be horrified. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Co-Pastor Lisa. I give my love to Pastor Larry. And um, praise God. And um, back to Karen, Karen and Ryan. Um, we'll talk about this more later on as the year progresses, but... Um, as Pastor Noel is looking to build a church to get a building, um, God has blessed me to have experience with that. We built a building in Chester, Pennsylvania years ago, and that church is now thriving. Uh, our building in uh, Kenya is thriving. So if, if Pastor Noel needs my, my assistance or any, any input, uh, prayers, we, we, we help you guys uh, to get your building and, and, and get that up. So we talk about that at a later time. We're here to encourage one another. Okay, um, we're looking at 2 Samuel today, tonight, verses 1 through 12, but I forgot to mention as we were looking at 1 Samuel, uh, because uh, many of you have um, in, your, in your 
homework you had to deal with giants. One of your questions dealt with giants, and a lot of people have been making reference to giants. Um, I want to make, make it uh, possible for you. You can get a copy. If you don't have a copy of my book, The Giants Are Back, and this is a real documentary on giants in the Old Testament and the New Testament time. I do a thorough, the Lord blessed me to do a thorough research of giants in the Old Testament, how they came about. And then we took giants in the New Testament. And then the Lord gave me a teaching, a revelation of giants that we are facing today. They're a little bit different from the Goliath type uh, or the sons of Anak, but the giants we are facing today and how Satan has resurrected an army of giants to destroy uh, the church, to destroy God's work. So if you don't have a copy of this, uh, I'll send you a free copy of this. Uh, we're asking for a donation for the ministry, whatever donation you can give. But if you don't have a donation, just send me an email anyway and request a copy of The Giants Are Back. Also, um, the Black Heroes of the Bible, that offer, uh, we sent that out early this month, that anyone who wants a free copy of this, same, same deal. Send a, send a donation to the ministry, and I'll, I'll forward you a, a copy of uh, Black Heroes of the Bible. This is a story of 21 Africans in the Bible and their contribution uh, to God's plan and, 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 and the whole Bible. Spiritually, scripturally sound, scripturally sound, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, this is, these books are available. Send me an email, and um, we'll get these out to you. Okay, but I'm not here to sell books tonight or push books. I'm giving these away to you free. We just ask for a donation for the ministry so that the proceeds will help us as we complete the work in the new church in Kenya. Uh, we sent them $3,500 last week, and that money is enough for them to plaster the building walls inside and outside. It's a large building they're building. Now they're going to plaster it inside and outside to keep it warm inside and to keep it dry, and uh, they're excited. And so pastor says they're, uh, be, they'll be purchasing the materials on Monday, and then they'll get their workers to working next week on doing that job. And then the pastor can have his quarters in the building. Well, we bless God for that, and we thank God for what the Lord is doing and that the praise is going out not only in America but throughout uh, Kenya. Okay. Uh, th thanks again, uh, Co-Pastor Lisa Johnson, for leading us in prayer. I want to just give you a little overview of Second Samuel, and this is from another book that I published, I wrote uh, two years ago, Understanding the Bible, the revised edition. <clears throat> this is the book we've used in our Through the Bible in One Year curriculum. Uh, I, I thank God for this book, but let's look at the overview of Second Samuel. Just want to read a little bit from uh, this book. Uh, even though the authorship of Second Samuel is far from certain, it was written probably by Abiathar, A B I A T H A R, Abiathar the priest, with the help of Gad the seer and Nathan the prophet. Now the word seer and prophet, they are the same. So we're looking at Abiathar the priest. We're looking at Gad and Nathan, the prophets, who probably wrote Second, Sam Second Samuel. The time of the writing of this book was between 931 and 722 B.C. We know it had to be written before 732 B.C. because um, Israel fell to um, the Assyrians in 722 B.C., and there's no mention at all in this book about the fall of the northern kingdom. Keep in mind that when I say between 931 and 722 B.C., the years, the numbers decrease. Okay, they, uh, for example, if I say a person was born in 1959 and, and, and is still living today in 2020, that's increasing the years. But in the Old Testament, your years decrease from the time of an event 
to the time of Christ. Okay, so 931 years, 931 was 931 years before Christ, 722 B.C., the time of the invasion of uh, is in northern Israel, uh, 722 years before Christ. And so as the events of the Old Testament proceed, the years decrease. So that by the time of the year 450, uh, you have your last input in the Old Testament, uh, roughly 450 B.C. And then between 450 B.C. and the time of John the Baptist, there is really no prophecy, no written prophecy, no recorded word from God. And so we date the date of, of the birth of Christ is uh, technically set at, at, at 1 A.D. or uh, 0 A.D. Uh, and his death approximately 34 A.D. So your, your years decrease in the time before Christ and the um, years increase from the birth of Christ up to the present day. Okay, the central message of 2 Samuel is King David, forerunner of the Messiah, or triumphs turn to s troubles through sin. And um, these books, 1 and 2 Samuel, were originally written as one book called the Book of Samuel. The books of First and Second Kings were written as one books, one book, uh, the Book of Kings, and the books of First and Second Chronicles were originally written as one book, but later were divided by the uh, Greek Bible, the Septuagint. Septuagint, okay. Okay, the Book of Second Samuel could possibly or probably be called the Book of David's reign. It begins with the ascendancy of David to the throne of Israel, and it covers the 40 years of his reign. He reigned for uh, six years and, a, and uh, several months. Um, he reigned for six years and seven months as uh, king of Judah, and then um, at, at uh, 30, what, 33 years uh, 37 years, 34 years, 34 years as king of all of uh, Judah and the northern kingdom. Okay, the central message again, King David, forerunner of the Messiah, or triumphs turn to troubles through sin. Okay, we see David's triumphs as we look at first uh, Samuel, Second Samuel 1 to 12, which is what we look at tonight. We look at his triumphs, and um, then next week we take a look at his triumphs turn into defeat because of his sin. And so, um, just wanted to share that with you from understanding the Bible, the Revised Version. Let's take a look at chapter 1 of Second Samuel now it came to pass after the, de the death of Samuel, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, that, and David had abode two days at Ziklag, and it came to pass on the third day that, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent and, the, and earth upon his head, and so it was when he came to David that he fell to the earth and did obeisance. Here's a man a beat up looking guy, uh, clothes rent, earth <clears throat> and ashes thrown on his head. And uh, he came to David, and David said unto him, From whence comest thou? And he said unto him, Out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. And David said unto him, How went the matter? In other words, how did things go uh, with Israel? Israel, uh, Saul had gone into war, and remember, the king of the Philistines did not allow David to go into that battle because David was an ally of, the, of that Philistine, Philistine king and the princes of Philistia did not trust David. They believed that if David went to war with them against Saul, David would turn against the Philistines, which I believe David would have done anyway. Anyway, 
David said, How was the matter? And I pray thee, tell me. And the man answered, That the people are fled from the battle, and many of the people also are fallen and dead, and Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. So we see in that battle that Saul and Jonathan and Jonathan's two brothers were killed in that battle. And David said unto the young man that told him, How knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan, his son, be dead? And the young man that told him said, As I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called unto me. And I answered, Here am I. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And he said unto me, Stand, I pray thee, upon me, and slay me, for anguish has come upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. So Saul was wounded, and Saul looked around and saw this Amalekite, and asked this Amalekite to run him through with the sword. Verse 10, So I stood upon him and slew him, because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. And I took the crown that was upon his head and the bracelet that was on his arm and I brought them hither unto my Lord. Now this guy thought he was going to get a big bounty, a reward from David for bringing him, for bringing him Saul's crown and Saul's bracelet. Verse 11, Then David took hold on his clothes and rent them. He tore his clothes and likewise, all the men that were with him. Ladies and gentlemen, as much as Saul wanted to kill David and the difficulties that David had with Saul, when David heard that Saul was dead, he rent his clothes in grief. Verse 12, And they mourned and wept and fasted unto even, meaning the evening, for Saul and for Jonathan his son, and for the people of the Lord, and for the house of Israel, because they were fallen by the sword. And David said unto the young man that told him, Whence art thou? And he answered, I am the son of a stranger, an Amalekite. And David said unto him, How wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? He asked the young man, Weren't you afraid to stretch forth your hand and kill the Lord's anointed? And David called one of his young men and said, Go near and fall upon him. And he smote him that he died. And David, David did not give the man the reward, the bounty that he expected to get. David had one of his soldiers to kill the guy. Why? And I find this a, to be a very perplexing passage of Scripture. I say, well, why did David kill the guy? I mean, uh, he was a Malachite and Saul asked the man to uh, uh, fall upon him. And, uh, but you know, murder is murder. And, 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 and David said, did you not have a fear of God to kill the Lord's anointed? So David, as much as he was uh, perplexed by Saul's hatred of him, David still had a love for Saul. And you have to admire that. And David said unto him, thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth has testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. And David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan, his son. And so the next several verses up through verse 27 are David's lament over Saul and Jonathan and David's sons who were killed in the war. So tonight we're looking at chapter 1, David's lament over Saul and Jonathan. Chapter 2, we're looking at Abner's defeat. Chapter 3, we're looking at how David's kinship grew, Abner's offer, Joab slays Abner, and David's mournings. You, got, you see a lot of killing, a lot of killing and taking of life in the Old Testament, ladies and gentlemen. Chapter 4, we study about the death of Ishbosheth. Ishbosheth was one of Saul's sons. Uh, okay. We're, in chapter 5, we're looking at David made king over all Israel. And then the Philistines challenged 
David after David was the, was inaugurated as king over all of Israel. The Philistines made war against David and Israel. Chapter 6, the power of the Ark of the Covenant. Real great chapter here. And then the Ark in Jerusalem, chapter 6. Chapter 7, we're looking at God's promise to David. And how David says, thou art great. Um, one of the themes of chapter 7, thou art great. How David worships the Lord. Chapter 8, David's victories. Chapter 9, Jonathan's son. Chapter 10, the children of Amnon made a big mistake. The, the, the Ammonites made a big mistake. Um, not the Ammonites, the children of Amnon made a big mistake. Okay, uh, chapter 11, David's great sin, and then Uriah the Hittite is killed. As we look at how great David was, and such a great man, a man of God, but yet this man committed a sin. And, and you'll see his response to the sin, and God's response to David. Then chapter 12, uh, if we were talking in the vernacular today, the, uh, we'd, say, we'd call chapter 12, we would uh, label chapter 12 as, you the man, David, you the man. <laughs> or the scripture says, thou art the man, David, thou art the man. But it's actually Nathan saying to David, you the man, David, you the man. And then uh, the death of David's child, David's repentance. And so we look at the, the rise of King David and, and, and his battles and his great victories. And then we look at David's great sin and, and uh, um, God's response to David uh, as a result of his sin. David committed a sin, ladies and gentlemen, and by, by the law, by, by right, the law, by the law, he should have been put to death. Um, but we see David repenting, falling on his face and repenting. And God spared David's life. So chapter 2, And it came to pass after this that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up into all the, any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said unto him, Go up. And David said, Whither shall I go up? And he said, unto Hebron. And so David had a close relationship with the Lord, ladies and gentlemen. He asked God questions. God gave him answers. And, and, and David asked God, shall I go up uh, uh, to any of the cities to fight? And uh, shall I, where shall I, what city to go to? And God showed him Hebron. Now Hebron, you may recall from previous studies, was where Caleb, said unto Joshua, give me this mountain. There are still Anakim there. And uh, 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 if you give me this mountain, I'll drive them out. And this takes us back to, uh, we give, have a powerful story about the Anakim in, in this book, The Giants Are Back. And uh, even to showing you where the Anakim are today. So David went hither. And his two wives also, he had Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, uh, Nabal's wife. Well, Nabal had died, so David married uh, Abigail. And his men that were with him did David bring up every man with his household, and they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. So David inquired of the Lord, where shall I go? Uh, David was getting ready to 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 do some real fighting, and he had to locate his people. They had li been living in Ziklag, Ziklag, which was a land of the Philistines, a city among the Philistines. But David now is seeking a place where he can take his wives and his children and his men and their wives and children and locate themselves. And so God gave them, told them to go to Hebron. And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah, and they told David, saying, that the men of Jabesh Gilead were they that buried Saul. So they anointed David king over Judah, which meant the southern kingdom, Judah and Benjamin. Judah and Benjamin made up the southern kingdom, and David became their king, um, and he ruled there for 
um, seven years. While after the inauguration, David was informed that the men of Jabesh Gilead were the ones who went and took Saul's body and, 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 and buried Saul's body. When Saul was killed and his sons, Jonathan and his other two sons, the um, Amalekites took Saul, Saul's body, cut his head off. They nailed his body. They nailed, pinned their bodies to a wall in a building in, uh, uh, in, 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 a, in a certain city. And when the men of Jabesh Gilead heard about what had happened to Saul, they marched all night long. And, and 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 went to that place and took down Saul's body, body and Jonathan's body. They burned Saul's body and Jonathan's body and buried their bones under a tree. So David David rewarded these men for being kind uh, to Saul even after Saul's death and for their bravery. Uh, David rewarded them. Verse eight of chapter two. But Abner the son of Ner. Captain of Saul's host took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim. Abner was a character. Abner was Saul's chief general. He was a bad dude. And um, when David was inaugurated king of the southern kingdom, Abner took Saul's son, or the remaining son, named Ishbosheth, and he made Ishbosheth king over the northern tribes of Israel. That's verse 8. And made him king over Gilead and over the Asherites and over Jezreel and over Ephraim and over Benjamin and over all Israel. So let me back up. David was not made ruler over Benjamin right away. He was made ruler over Judah. Okay, Ishbosheth was made ruler over Benjamin and the other northern tribes. Okay, verse 12, And Abner the son of Ner the, and the servants of Ishbosheth the son of Saul went out from Maonam to Gibeon. And Joab the son of Zariah and the servants of David went out and met together by the pool of Gibeon. Now you have at this time two main characters. They were generals. Abner had been Saul's general and Joab was David's general. And so these two hated one another. And so they didn't fight each other yet. They didn't fight each other. But what they did, uh, Abner took 12 of his men. And Joab took 12 of his men. And they put the 12 men together, the 24 men together, so they could fight each other. And they uh, fought and, 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 and tried to kill one another. And so they, that was sport. Verse 16, and they caught everyone, his fellow, by the head and thrust his sword in the fellow's side. So they fell down together, wherefore that place was called Halkath Hazarim, which is in Gibeon. Can you imagine you saying you're from Halkath Hazarim? And there was a very sore battle that day, and Abner was beaten, and the men of Israel before the servants of David. So David's army uh, put a whooping on Abner's army. Okay, verse 19, and Asahel pursued after Abner. Okay, now Asahel was um, one of three brothers. Verse 18, back up. There were three sons of Zariah there, Joab and Abishai and Asahel. And Asahel was a, as light a foot as a wild row, and Asahel pursued after Abner, and in going, he turned not to the right hand, nor to the left from following after Abner. So Asahel was on Abner's tail. I mean, and Asahel was fast. And Abner looked behind him, verse 20, and said, Art thou Asahel? And he said, I am. And Abner said to him, Turn thee aside to thy right hand, or to thy left, and lay thee hold on one of the young men, and take thee his armor. But Asahel would not turn aside from following of him. Abner tried to get Asahel to follow after someone else and, and leave him alone. But Asahel had made up his mind he was going to kill Abner. And Abner said, uh, anyway, he refused to turn around. Howbeit, verse 23, he refused to turn aside 
wherefore Abner with the hinder end of his spear smote him under the fifth rib. So if you can imagine, Abner is running from Asahel, and Asahel's on, on, almost on top of Abner, and Abner takes his spear that he's running, and he's got a spear in front of him, and he turns the spear backwards and thrusts it backwards, and catches Asahel between the fifth rib and killed Asahel. They, they give you a lot of detail about this because it's important to know uh, about the bitterness, the hatred between Joab, who was David's general, and Abner, Saul's general. And later on, you'll see that uh, Joab and his, his family never forgot how um, how um, Abner had killed Zariah's son Asahel and um, that became a real bitter thing even with David because David did not like the way David did not like the way Joab killed Abner even though Abner was David's enemy but Abner had been the general of Saul and so David had a, had a relationship. They had a friend, a, 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 a respectful relationship, Abner and David. And so David's general, Joab, eventually kills Abner, and David has to deal with Joab. So we find some very intriguing things in this study of Scripture. Okay. CK, are you following me in this? CK is uh, CK is a wonderful student. She's down in Texas, and she she always comments me on on our lesson. And uh, I, I love the way she studies and and follows us. CK, are you following me in this dialogue? Yeah, yes, I am. And I have to say, this was a little more difficult for me because I got all those names messed up. So I've been through this several times, and so okay. I think I got it now. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, the names, and ladies and gentlemen, thank you, CK, for sharing that with us because the names can be confusing because we've got Zariah, we've got Asahel, you've got Asahel's two brothers, we've got Joab, we've got Abner, and when you look at those, all those names, it can be confusing. But when you look at Abner, Abner was the general for Saul. Joab was David's general. And uh, then you got uh, Ishbosheth. Then we have Mephibosheth. And it can be, CK, it can be very confusing, but you've got to kind of line them up and picture them on one side, okay? Uh, Abner was, Saul, was Saul's general. Abner uh, uh, was hated by Joab, who was David's general. And then when we look at Ishbosheth, Abner set up Ishbosheth as the king against David. And uh, then uh, later on, we find that after Ishbosheth is, is killed, then David is looking for some or the any more relatives of Saul. And so they say, yes, he has a lame son. His name is Mephibosheth. And so we got Ishbosheth who was a king for a while, a very short while. Then we have Mephibosheth, who was a, he was a crippled man, and, and David honored him. David showed honor to the son, the grandson of Saul, who was actually Jonathan's son. And so, yes, the name, CK, the names, my friends, can be very, very confusing. For example, look at chapter 3. Now there was long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. And, Dave, and unto David were sons born in Hebron. And his firstborn was Amnon and of Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess. I mean, that's confusing enough right there. I mean, the son's son was Amnon and we're going to talk about Amnon later on, where the Am Am Amnonites made a great mistake. Then uh, we have a wife of David named Ahinoam. Now, we already see he has Ahinoam. He has uh, uh, Abigail. And then, but there are more. Verse chapter 3. 
the third Absalom here had a son named Absalom, who was uh, the son of Maacah, the daughter of Talmai. These names can be confusing. Then there's a fourth wife, a fourth son, Adonijah, the son of Haggith. There's a fifth son, Shephatiah, the son of Abital. There's a sixth son, Ithraim, by Eglah, David's wife. These were born to David in Hebron. Now these are just the sons born in Hebron. David had other wives, ladies and gentlemen. David had about a total of about 30 wives. Then when you, we look at uh, um, um, First Chronicles, we, when we look at, uh, actually, yeah, First Chronicles, we're going to be looking at David, I mean Solomon. Solomon had, what, um, 300 wives, 700 concubines, and I mean, I mean, all these wives and concubines, I mean, and children after all these. Then when we go back, we look at Gideon. Gideon had uh, a lot of wives. He had 70 children. Gideon had 70 sons. They don't even mention the number of daughters Gideon had, 70 sons. And so when it comes to names, CK, there are a lot of names. So just try to, try to work with them. Try to pick out the major characters and, and um, uh, study around them. That can, that can help you. And so when we look at these early chapters of uh, 2 Samuel, we're looking at, the major characters are David. We're looking at Abner, who was had been Saul's general. And Abner is actually David's enemy. Then we're looking at Joab, who is David's general. And Joab hates Abner. And then all these names in between. I... I got that they they didn't get along and they were on the separate side of a water or something. But then I got a little bit sideswiped when it said something like they took their however many, each side had an equal number, and they did sport. Well, I didn't realize they were fighting to kill each other until, you know, it went on a little ways. So sometimes the wording... It's different than our wording today, you know, what the means, meaning is. Yes, yes, yes it is. Uh, that is why, that is why uh, it does not hurt to have a, a, a uh, modern translation of the Bible, CK, and, and, and students, you, you might want to get a modern translation of the Bible. I teach from the King James Bible. I study from the King James Bible, but it <laughs> won't hurt to have a living Bible or uh, uh, NIV or another version where you can get a more up-to-date interpretation. Um, I, I love the King James Bible because there's very little that you're going to lose when you study from the King James Bible. But the King James can be rather complicated at times. And so um, if, if you can get you a, a, another version or other versions... You, you'll do very well. By the way, um, I, I downloaded uh, BibleGateway.com, BibleGateway.com uh, on, on my computer, and you can go to any passage of Scripture, uh, any verse or any passage, and read it, and then you can go to any translation and look at it. So you, can, you have about on BibleGateway.com, you can get up to 60, 60 different translations of the Bible in various degrees of the English language. And, and by studying that, um, you can get um, a greater understanding of the King James Bible. So I find that to be very helpful. Every now and then, you, I might want to go on BibleGateway.com and see how they handle a certain passage of Scripture and... Um, might be easier. When I, years ago, hey, when my children were, were little, I bought each of them a a children's living Bible, and I'm looking at my bookshelf to see if I still have a copy. I bought each of my children a children's living Bible, which was a Bible written for children. It was not a word for word translation. It was more of a paraphrase, but 
a lot of times when I was studying uh, for a sermon or studying the Bible or when I was in seminary, <coughs> I would turn to, I would borrow one of my kids' Bibles and read it because the Children's Living Bible just gave me a, a real child's look at the Scriptures. And uh, every now and then, grown-ups need to take a look at a child's look at the Scriptures for clarification. Okay. Any comments, any questions, anybody <coughs> thus far? Okay. Um, chapter 4, we see the death of Ishbosheth. Ishbosheth was set up to be king by Abner, but uh, he didn't stay king too long. Chapter 5, we see David made king over all of Israel, and the Philistines challenged David. And then chapter 6, we look at the power of the Ark of the Covenant. Let's take a look at that. Again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David gathered together 30,000 men. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him to Baal, Baal of Judah, to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. Okay, you have to understand a little bit about the ark of the covenant and the Lord of hosts dwelt between the cherubims, these cherubs that were on top of the ark and their wings stretched out and touched one another. And the, and, and the Lord had told Moses to build an ark and that he would dwell between the cherubim of the ark. In other words, the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, Covenant had two angelic beings, cherubims, whose wings touched one another, and God called that the mercy, mercy seat, and he promised he would answer from the mercy seat, which was between that space of the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, between the two cherubims, cherubims. And they set the Ark of God upon a new cart. Okay, here's a scenario. David gathers 30,000 soldiers. They're going to move the Ark of the Covenant into Judah. Now, the Ark had been captured by the Philistines. And as you learned from last week's lesson, um, no, no, you, the ark, let me back up off that. The Ark was captured by the Philistines, and the, then the Philistines from last week's lesson the Philistines caught so much trouble because they possessed the Ark of the Covenant that they wanted to get rid of it. And they, so they said, take it back to, to Israel. Take the Ark back to the Israelites. And um, one, one of your homework questions uh, had to deal with um, why the Philistines were not slaughtered by God because they touched the Ark. And we believe that because they were ignorant of God's law, uh, they were permitted to touch the Ark of the Covenant. But when the Jews touch the Ark of the Covenant, we see death, as we see in this particular chapter. And they set the Ark of God upon a new cart, verse 3, and brought it out of the house of Abinabad, Abinadab, that was in Gibeah, and Uzzah, and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, dr drove the new cart. In your homework assignment, I misspelled Uzzah, and your question asked, uh, why uh, did God punish Uzziah? It's not Uzziah. Uzziah was the brother, was the, Uzziah was the cousin of Isaiah. So uh, make that correction in that homework. It's not Uzziah. We're looking at Uzzah, U-Z-Z-A-H. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah. Verse 5, And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all matter, manner of instruments. They played instruments. They worshiped God. They praised the Lord. But, verse 6, And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. So, uh, you'll see that when they brought the ark out, when the ark had moved, when they had moved the, uh, the uh, carriers of the ark, and they were carrying them on staves, poles that were um, carrying the ark through the circles, the rings on the ark, they took six steps 
and then they uh, made a sacrifice. But then, uh, made a sacrifice unto the Lord, but then the oxen shook, and the ark fell. And while the ark was falling, Uzzah tried to stop the ark from falling. Ladies and gentlemen, you'll say, wow, this is real. Uzzah touched the ark of the covenant in his best effort to try to prevent that ark from falling to the ground. And because he touched the ark of the covenant, he got killed. Verse 7, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, his rashness. And there he died by the ark of God. And verse 8, David was displeased. In other words, David was angry with the Lord because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. And he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day, or to the writing, uh, to the day of this writing, uh, whether Abiathar wrote it or whether Gad wrote this, um, or Nathan, whoever wrote Second Samuel. Okay, uh, at the time of the writing, the name of the place where the man touched the ark was named Perez Uzzah. You've got to understand this scenario, ladies and gentlemen, because you say, wow, God is somebody not to play with. Here's a man trying to stop this ark from falling to the ground, and he touched the ark, but he died because he touched the ark. He died because he violated God's law. No one was to touch the ark of the covenant with his hands. After uh, Moses had instructed the building of the ark and, 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 and had Aaron and his brother the place in the ark, the uh, table, the tablets and the uh, Aaron's rod that budded and the pot of manna when the lid, when the cover of the ark, uh, the mercy seat was laid on top of the ark, that meant nobody ever had the right or the privilege of opening that ark. Nobody was to touch it with their hands. The ark was to be moved by sliding a pole on each side of it through the two rings on the side of the ark, and men were to take those poles and lift the ark, but never to put their hands on the ark. The Philistines were uh, blessed to be able to touch the ark without being put to death because they did not know God's law, but God's people knew the law. And so Uzzah died, ladies and gentlemen. God killed him. He died. And David had a case with God. Verse 8, David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. Verse 9, and David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, meaning Jerusalem. But David carried it out aside, aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. So David uh, was displeased, but David was also afraid because he knew that the wrath of God had fallen on Uzzah. And so David said, well, we, we will not take the ark into Jerusalem this day. And so they lifted the ark on those poles that they had it on and t took it to the house of Obed-Edom, a Gittite who lived nearby, verse 11, and the ark continued in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And it was told King David, saying, The Lord had blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. Okay, so they brought it up uh, from Obed-Edom several three months later. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. And then we see David's wife, Michael. Okay, another one of David's wives, Saul's daughter. She was so angry at David, so jealous, seeing him praising the Lord. Asks if he's jealous, and she so she says. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. 
she should have been praising the Lord with David. And they brought it in the ark of the Lord and set it in the place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. Okay, verse 20, then David returned to bless his household, and Michael, the daughter of Saul, came, up, came out to meet David, saying, and said, how glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants, as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovereth herself. She was jealous. And David said unto Michael, it was before the Lord. Check this out. David said, it was before the Lord which chose me before thy father and before all this house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord. Verse 22, and I will yet be more vile than this, than thus, and will be base in mine own sight and of the hand of the maid, maid servants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child until the day of her death. Her jealousy, her jealousy kept her from having children. Now, David had commanded uh, that Abner, Abner tried to make a deal with David uh, some time ago before Abner was put to death. And, and Abner, David said, if we're going to make a deal, you bring my wife, Michael, back to me and Abner brought his wife, Michael, back, and Abner knew that Michael had been given to another man, <clears throat> and the man followed them, crying and boo-hooing, and then Adam, Abner at some point said, go back to where you belong. This is David's wife. Saul had given Michael to another man. David said, hey, if we're going to make a deal, Abner, you bring my wife back to me. And this wife, Michael, she was so jealous watching David uh, worship the Lord. She said, you're just doing that to impress the, the maidens. And, and, and David said, yeah, well, I'm going to be more vile than this because God is first. What he's saying is, look, hey, God made me ruler of Israel. He appointed me over your father, and I worship the Lord. And what he was saying to her is, God is number one in my life, and you haven't seen anything yet. If you think I was vile and, 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 uh, uh, unpleasing in praising the Lord today. You wait. You haven't seen anything yet. Okay? And so um, she, her womb was shut up. She had no children. Uh, now, verse 23. Listen, listen to the way this reads, C.K., in the King James Version. Verse 23 of chapter 6. Therefore Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child until the day of her death. Now, if you read this, C.K., you'll say, wow, she had a child the day she died. That's the way the King James Bible is written. I mean, the syntax, I mean, it's kind of complicated. But no, it does not mean she had a child on the day that she died. It means that from the time that she reprimanded her husband to the time she died, she did not have any children. Okay, um... God's promise to David, and it came to pass when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest about from all his enemies. Then that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in the house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said, Do what you have to do. And David desired to build a house for the Lord. But God told David, No, you cannot build me a house. God told him, you have shed blood. You've committed uh, killings. You cannot build me a house, but your son will build me a house. And so chapter 7 uh, teaches that, and uh, David accepted that, and David said, Thou art great, O Lord. Thou art great, O Lord. Chapter 8 is all about David's victories and, and all the different Kings and people that he smote. And there are a lot of names in there, C.K., uh, brothers and sisters, a lot of names. Okay, verse 5 of chapter 8. And when the Syrians of Damascus came to succor Hadad Ezer, king of Zobah, David slew of the Syrians two of 20,000 men. 
Okay, then when you go on down, uh, verse 9, when Toei, king of Hamath, heard that David had smitten all the hosts of Hadad Ezer, then Toei sent Joram. Okay, so there are a lot of names, so you've got to kind of read these names, but don't let them throw you. Uh, don't let them throw you. Verse 17, and Zadok, the son of Ahatob, and Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar, Abiathar is the writer of this book, were the priests, and Sariah was the scribe, and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over both the Cherethites and the Pelethites, and David's sons were chief rulers. Woo! Kind of confusing, all these names. <clears throat> Chapter 9 is all about Jonathan's son. They find that Jonathan had a son, and he was crippled uh, when he was younger because his nurse dropped him when they were fleeing uh, from the enemy. The nurse dropped Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, and Mephibosheth was a cripple all his life. Okay, And so David wanted to honor any living relative of King Saul and he found that Jonathan had a son named Mephibosheth. So David brought Mephibosheth in to live in the palace with David, and he ate at the king's table regularly, and David made sure that Mephibosheth, in fact, Mephibosheth, even though he was crippled, he had a family, he had children, and he had servants, and David made sure they were taken well care of, and Mephibosheth uh live royally in David's household for the rest of his life. Okay, verse 7 of chapter 9, And David said unto him, Fear not, I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake. Okay. Chapter 10, we see <clears throat> the children of Amnon made a big mistake. Amnon was one of David's sons. And... Um, David uh, tried to reconcile himself with them, and um, they turned against David and killed the ambassadors. Not, no, they didn't kill the ambassadors. They stripped <coughs> the ambassadors that David sent, shaved the half of their beards, and left the other half on their face, cut their clothes off uh, up above the buttocks, so they had to run uh, semi-naked. Uh, back home, and their beards half cut, and they shamed these men, and David had to go and slaughter uh, these people with his army. Uh, chapter 11, <clears throat> read chapter 11. We've read this many times in our Bible studies about uh, David and Bathsheba, and it starts off with it came to pass that after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon, Ammon, not Amnon, Ammon, and besieged Rabbah, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. Ladies and gentlemen, it was a time when the kings made war with one another. must have been the spring of the year, and where kings went out and led their armies into battle. But David said he was tired, he wasn't going, and he sent General Joab into the battle. And David decided he would stay at home and let his army battle for him. And um, that was all right. He, had the, uh, he could delegate that authority, but verse 2, and it came to pass in an eventide, at evening that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. He was restless, so he took a walk on the roof of his house. <clears throat> and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look on. And the rest of the story uh, describes David's downfall, his sin. He sent a messenger uh, find out who this woman was, and um, next thing you know, he brought her to his house. And now he already had a lot of wives there, but he saw this, this woman, and he had to have her, and her name was Bathsheba. 
and she was the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And Uriah happened to be a soldier in David's army out there fighting with Joab and the army against the enemy. And so David uh, brought her there, and, and they, they, they uh, engaged in sex. And, she, and later on, uh, she sent David a message. She was pregnant. And then David tried to scheme, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> he tried to scheme. David, the great man of God. And the, the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And you see this great man of God scheming. And, and the, the devil gave him a scheme. And David, uh, when he discovered she was uh, married to Uriah the Hittite, David sent for Uriah to bring him home from the battlefield real quickly. David wanted to do that timing thing, ladies and gentlemen. And David's whole thing was, if I can get Uriah to sleep with his wife, then by the time this child is born, uh, Uriah will think it was his child, if I time this thing right. And he brought Uriah back from the battlefield and, and, and encouraged him to go and spend some time with his wife. Uriah slept. Uh, outside of David's palace with the rest of David's servants. When David found out that Uriah did not go home with his wife, he was angry. David next tried to get the man drunk. The man even drunk. He wouldn't go to see his wife because he said, hey, uh, I'm not going to go and sleep with my wife. The Joab and the army of Israel is out sleeping in the battlefield. And why should I go and sleep with my wife when my, my comrades are sleeping uh, on the battlefield? And Uriah would not go and spend any time with his wife. So, boom, there goes David's scheme. He had a great plan, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, he had that plan down to the T. Only thing, Uriah didn't go home and sleep with his wife. And so David stuck with, he's got a pregnancy on his hand. And he's made a, he's caused a, 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 another man's wife to be pregnant, and he can't scheme his way out of it. And so David uh, sends, writes a note, ladies and gentlemen. He writes a letter to Joab, and says, and and, and sends that letter with Uriah, and Uriah carries his own death sentence back to the battlefield. And the letter, in essence, said, put. Uriah in the thick of the battle and withdraw all the soldiers from him and make sure he is killed in battle. And that's the way it panned out. And, uh, and David thought he was clean. Ladies and gentlemen, we can't hide our sins. Sin will find us out. Uh, uh, we can't cover our sins. There's only one way that covers sin, and that's through the blood of Jesus. And, 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 and Jesus takes away our sins, but repentance must come. Repentance must come. There are a lot of people uh, 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 going, going around trying to cover the sins, hiding their sins, um, but God was not pleased. And so God sent Nathan the prophet. Nathan the prophet went to visit David, and Nathan told David about this man who had all of this cattle and oxen and sheep, and a, a visitor came, and, and instead of taking one of his own sheep and, and killing that and, and preparing a meal, he took the sheep that belonged to this poor neighbor who only had one sheep, I mean the family pet, and killed him. And David said, who is that man? That man, whoever did that, ought to be put to death. And that's when Nathan said to David, you the man, David. You the man. You are the man. You're the one, David. And David's eyes were open, and David uh, realized he couldn't hide his sin, and, he, and he, he repented. He put sackcloth and ashes on and went into a fast and, and, and fasted and prayed and repented and groaned unto the Lord, cried unto the Lord. And then um, when he received the message from his servants that the child that uh, he had fathered through Bathsheba was dead. Uh, David um, washed himself up, put on clothing, and, and, and declared an end to the fast and began worshiping the Lord again because he, David, David knew. David knew that God was going to kill him because David had broken God's law. But God spared David. 
because David repented. Later on, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you'll see God saying in his word, David is a man after my own heart. And when you, when you really want to take a look at David's heart and what was going on on the inside of him at this time, read Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is all about David's internal, uh, internalization of his sin against God and his sin against Uriah the Hittite and causing the death of Uriah and eventually causing the death of the child that was in uh, that, that Bathsheba gave unto him. David repented and, and then in Psalm 51 he says, Against thee, against thee only, thee only have I sinned, O God. And then he said, Wash me with hyssop. Wash me, wash me, and, 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 and David repented, and God forgave him of his sins. Ladies and gentlemen, this was years, about a thousand years before Jesus Christ died on the cross. And there is no, there is no sin that uh, God will not forgive us of if we repent and, 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 and all kinds of things going on. But God is God of love and mercy. And unless you you sin the sin of of uh, the uh, the sin that cannot be forgiven, and people believe is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, whatever has been done in your life or whatever is done in my life, if we re- truly repent, mean truly turn from it, truly grieve, truly uh, commit it to the Lord, truly ask God for forgiveness, God will forgive. Why? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. God has made a way that we don't have to perish because of our sins, but he's made a way of escape. Uh, second, um, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, I think, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but who will, along with the temptation, also make the way of escape. God has made it a a way of escape for all of us, and that's to call upon the name of Jesus. And, And if you're not saved, get saved. You can be saved tonight. Receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and God will remove all of your iniquities. The Bible says as far as the east is, from the West, so far has he removed our iniquities from us. And if you are saved, and if you sin, if you backslide, be quick to repent. Be quick to repent. Don't try to gloss over it. Don't try to cover it up. No, be like David. Be quick to repent. David tried to cover it up for a while. But when the prophet brought the word of God. You see, the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. You can't even hide your thoughts from the word of God. The word of God divides the soul and the spirit, the bone and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So when Nathan gave David the word that came from the Lord, David repented, and then God told Nathan that uh, to tell David, I will not kill you. You will not die. Ladies and gentlemen, we serve a merciful, loving God. Walk with him. Don't let anything separate you from the love of God. And I like what David told Michael, his wife. I love the Lord. He's first in my life. Yes, I'm going to dance before the Lord. And even if you don't like it, I'm going to dance before the Lord. And you know what? You haven't seen anything yet. You haven't seen anything yet. I've got a lot of praise for the Lord. And ladies and gentlemen, when you look at that, I've got praise inside of me. Uh, Karen, you got praise inside of you. Uh, 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 Krista, you got praise inside of you. Uh, Brian, you got praise inside of you. Ryan, you got praise inside of you. And and, and, uh, Lisa CK, you've got praise inside. Jackie, you've got praise inside of you that nobody has seen. I mean, just worship the Lord. Just praise him. And, and, And what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. I'm trying to stop teaching. I'm I'm trying. What a mighty God we serve.
angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. We will end here. Praise God. And uh, those of you who were not able to come on live with us, I, I hope this recording has been a blessing to you. I thank those of you who have been on live with us. We're going to end the recording, and then we will entertain any questions that anyone may have. God bless you, and please be feel free to call me or email me and uh, get in touch with me uh, if you have any questions. By the way, uh, the Giants are back. You can get a free copy of this or uh, the Black Heroes of the Bible. We're celebra celebrating Black History Month. Just send me a message, and I'll get these out to you. God bless you.